the inaugural 1970-1971 Walt Disney World Ambassador before serving other roles at the resort. And the third is an opening day cast member who has gone on to lead Disney parks and resorts all over the world. Among his executive leadership roles, Chief Operating Officer for Disneyland Paris, President of Disneyland Resort, President of the Walt Disney World Resort, and he currently serves as the President of Segment Development and Enrichment for Disney Parks, Experiences and Products, and is the Global Ambassador for the Walt Disney World 50th Anniversary Celebration. Let's give a big Destination D23 welcome to Peggy Ferris, Debbie Dane Brown, and George A. Calabritis. <laughs> Well, so great to see all three of you. I am honored to share the stage with each of you because all of you have been associated with the Walt Disney World Resort since before our resort opened. Um, all of you are here on opening day, incredible. And all of you have had roles that are, in my view, very ambassadorial in nature, sharing the magic of this place to an always eager audience. So with that said, I wanna make sure I got this straight. 50 years ago next month, all three of you were actually working at the very same Walt Disney World location, right? And where was that? Contemporary Resort Right here at the Contemporary. So if you checked in in 1971, you might have seen all three of our incredible guests here today. So big round of applause again for these incredible leaders and members. Now, I would love to start a discussion with you, Peggy, because yesterday you were sharing a little bit about a remarkable event that happened in 1969 when you were chosen as one of 10 Disneyland hostesses to represent the magic of Walt Disney World at a press event that helped announce the project. So with that said, we have an incredible series of stories in our book that talk about it and some wonderful photography you shared. What was it like having worked at Disneyland for so long, now seeing this vast Florida site for the first time? Well, you know, I, I grew up in Anaheim. Disneyland was, was a wonderful place we visited every year. Um, and I lived in Orange County, California. In my neighborhood, we had a, an orange tree. Everybody in our neighborhood had an, or, an orange tree in our backyard. And then we arrived in Orlando. We drove uh, west to Ocoee. And I was just struck by how rural it was. You know, there's, um, if, if we were looking out across the, uh, the surrounding area, it was just filled with orange groves, as far as you could see. And I knew I wasn't in Southern California because the air was warm and humid. And, um, and I think because you could see forever, I felt like the sky was so blue. We had a little bit of a smog problem back in California, so I'd never seen such a big, blue, beautiful sky before. Um, so, and, and in fact, here's a picture of Jane Llewellyn looking out from the second floor of the Ramada Inn in Ocoee. And as you can see, I mean, there's a little fruit stand, probably selling oranges, right across the, the street from the motel. And, uh, and then you can see a little bit of a, a, a circus tent. And uh, it was filled with a, an amazing model. There was, it was about 600 square feet, 40 feet across. Uh, just representing what the first phase of Walt Disney World would be. And, um, you know, I was very familiar with Disneyland, so seeing the Magic Kingdom and knowing it would be the centerpiece for the phase one was great. But this was also the first entry uh, for Disney into actually guests' stays. So extending that, that hospitality and themed environment to the resort hotels was really something very special for us. Um, and the, and the, the presentation area was filled with art. We had lots of, we had uh, models, audio animatronic figures, Waco Rogers was there to, to animate the figures. It was, it was really just amazing. Oh, that's so special. And um, you also had a film that was screened at the Parkwood Cinema, I believe, not terribly far away. Yeah. Right? Yes, right. And so we, we took, we, it was a three-day event actually, the press coming on the first day, and then uh, leaders of American business who might be interested in participating in the project were invited the second day, and then the Florida legislator,
came the third day. And we, so the first day we had the press conference in, at the Parkwood Cinema Theater. And then all the attendees boarded buses. And we'd been studying really hard um, to learn this, the um, spiel that Marty Scholar had drafted for us. And we took guests out. But the thing was, we drove for, once we left Pine Hills, we drove for miles through the pine forests and palmetto. And I mean, it really felt like the wilderness. Yeah, how oh, incredible. And Debbie, you sort of grew up amid that wilderness. Um, you grew up in a very small Florida town, Forest City. And your story is almost the mirror of Peggy's because you then have to learn what a Disneyland was going to be like. Um, and in the book, you do this remarkable essay you contributed for us. Um, everyone has to get the book just for Debbie's essay. Um, and you tell the great stories of how you first became associated with the Walt Disney World Preview Center. I would love if you could tell us a little bit about the Preview Center, what it was like for you and the many guests who are curious about Walt Disney World. Thank you, Susan. And I do just want to quick take one second to say good morning, Destination D23 family. We are so grateful that you're here to share this time with Peggy, George, and I, because you can imagine it's been a wonderful weekend and so many memories. We, we have just loved it and you've made it a lot of fun. So um, thank you for that, for joining us. The, uh, and I am gonna have one more aside real quick before I go to the previous center. I drove out to the property for, to interview. This was in a, probably September of 1969, made a quick stop. Uh, Johnny's Corner turned left, got to the interview building, went inside, and at that moment, I saw Valerie Watson and Holly Holsher, who were the most beautiful, sophisticated Disney girls that I ever could have managed. I basically lived in a citrus grove in Forest City. <laughs> These women were a wonderful. Talked to them for a few minutes, filled out my application, and at that point, I did not want to leave. I knew right then that I was in love with all things Disney, that I wanted to be a part of the Preview Center. I wanted to be a Disney girl, as they called us. I wanted one of those 14 positions, and I wanted Walt Disney World. I didn't know what that meant, but I wanted Walt Disney World. Um, so then on to the Preview Center. Yeah, we even have some great uh, photos here as well that kind of yes. show your life there. That's our wonder, our costume. It was the prettiest thing I think I'd ever worn. It was wonderful. Uh, our Disney designers designed that red, white, and blue A-frame. The preview center itself was a, and you can go by and see it, but it was a gorgeous building, very clean lines. So I'm going to take you on a quick little tour as if you came first day at the preview center. And I'm welcoming you at the front door. So welcome to the Walt Disney World Preview Center. I'd like you to sign the guest book from the name of from whatever state you're in. Oh, you have residence in two states. Then please sign both books. Mm -hmm. Then I would invite you into the uh, theater where we would show a film. It was a short film, but so educational. and Everybody got a good basic idea of what Walt Disney World was going to be like. Because most of us in the eastern United States had not been to Disneyland. I had not been. I did not know anyone that had been. So uh, the the interest was incredible, and and uh, so we had our film. And it, in fact, Peggy and I discovered that the model that I had at the preview center, the big uh, to scale model, was the same one that she had at the press conference that she helped host us uh, six months before. And interesting, I just realized that that model was actually bigger than the apartment I lived in in Orlando <laughs> at the time. Uh, so we, um, we, we took you out of the theater then, down the halls of the previous center. There was remarkable wed artist renderings there, John Hench um, and Herbie Ryman. The, the artwork, I had not been exposed to anything like that. I was 18. It was, it was truly... A, an experience just to see that. At the end of our tour, you were invited to enjoy a cup of fresh Florida orange juice. And then we had a merchandise area, which, which we had guests actually come just to buy Disney merchandise since we had the best selection. So the previous summer was a wonderful way to, to greet over a million guests that were very interested in Walt Disney World. Our job, to wow them and to bring them back. <laughs> Incredible. 
got to make that dream of Walt Disney World, all these models that you were showcasing, that, that had to be brought to life by people. And I wanna show a photograph here because this was the Walt Disney World Employment Center in June of 1971 it opened, originally welcoming about 1,800 candidates a week, but by opening day would interview some 75,000 people for only 5,500 roles for the opening cast. And George, you were one of those cast members who showed up during these frenzied days of hiring. What was it like? You know, what, what kind of inspired you to, to go to the employment center? And um, what was your experience of casting like? So, first of all, you said June. You know how hot it is in June. So that looks like an idyllic situation. It was so hot you could not even imagine. And you were standing in a very long line to be able to just get a postcard to be able to get an interview. For me, I had just graduated from high school. I needed a job um, while I was going to work my way through college. I, like Debbie said, I knew they were building Disney World but I'd never been to Disneyland. So I really didn't understand what it was. And as you know, at that time, you really couldn't see anything from the freeway. So you just, it was a big gamble, so to speak. But I was fortunate to be able to get an interview and um, as I shared with the group, it was a very scientific process how we were hired and, and cast into roles. You had an interview time, you came into the trailer, you're in a lobby, they'd call the next 10 names for the one o'clock interview. All 10 of you would stand up, you'd walk down a center corridor. There were five offices on either side of the corridor. Unbeknownst to us, one office was hiring for park operations, park foods, hotels, whatever, and literally the luck of the draw, I happened to walk into the office that was hiring for hotels, and that's how my career began. So, but it worked out well, and um, you know, it was from there quickly into traditions, and what was unique for the hotel people, um, I was hired and then told after traditions the next day to report to a Hilton Inn on International Drive, and it's because Disney had leased a hotel, it's still there today, it's a Rosen Hotel. International Drive, if you can believe it, was a dirt road off of Sand Lake Road. Mm -hmm. And it was the only thing there, but Disney had leased it for a year to be able to train all of the hotel people and then all of the Disney people who were uh, coming here from California actually lived there in that hotel and so we served them for two or three weeks until we moved here to the Contemporary. Incredible, so. and so much change in Central Florida during that time and, and since, I know. Um, so Peggy, I actually wanna talk a little bit about so much of that change that was beginning in 1969 when you looked out on that vast construction site. <laughs> what was it like to see this amazing landscape and were there any skeptics, people who thought this mammoth project couldn't be done? Well, you know, the, the presentation at Parkwood was impressive. Marty had written the, the film the tour of the site you can just imagine you you're traveling through the wilderness and then you come upon this enormous earth moving project you know moving four and a half million cubic yards of earth from what would become the seven seas lagoon to the theme park site so then we could build utilidors essentially on the first level um, there were there was a balloon flying where the castle would be if you turned and looked in the other direction across the excavation, the vast excavation. There was a balloon for where the Polynesian would be, the Contemporary Resort Hotel. It was so monumental. And people, I think, were very impressed with our, we just had this can-do attitude. It was like, of course, Walt Disney had a vision, and then he assembled people who had worked on the original Disneyland, and. We know what we're doing. It was very ambitious, though. And so I think our enthusiasm and positivity was really contagious. But I met one very cynical, um, skeptical, I guess, journalist from New York. And he, he, he actually kind of cornered me and said, you know, come on, what's with all the smiling? <laughs> I said, no, really, we, we're, we, this is who we are. And he, he really grilled me for a while. The beautiful part was, two years later, I was back at Walt Disney World because I'd seen this project and said, I want to be a part of this. I was back working in the hotels, and, and the press came for the dedication weekend, and I recognized him. 
and I was able to go up to him and greet him by his name, because I'd remembered him, and I think at that point he really believed we were the real deal, and this was <laughs> really going to happen. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, that joy is so contagious. Well, Debbie, you also led many a site tour on property, especially beginning in 1970 when you were named the very first Walt Disney World ambassador. One of your first tasks, though, was actually to head out to the West Coast, of all places. Tell us a little bit about how your experiences here at Disneyland would prepare you to be that first ambassador. I had the great fun of flying out in Walt's plane. I remember getting on the plane uh, my, with my chaperone, because at that point you had a chaperone mm -hmm. that, you, in fact, he was a wonderful uh, ex-Marine sergeant, and I called him old craggy face, but never to his face. <laughs> and he, his name was Frank Forsythe. I loved him dearly, and I was very safe with him. So we flew out, and I was sitting in Walt's plane. I, in, I was trying to act cool, because all the disc executives were in there, and very important people. But instead, my body was going, oh my gosh, I can walk this this play. I can't believe this. I wish we'd had cell phones back then. I would have been snappy photos. Um, landed. Frank took me to the Disneyland Hotel. I had never stayed in such a beautiful hotel. Uh, it was wonderful. And I didn't sleep that night. The next morning, Frank came, got me, and we walked into Disneyland. My life, it's kind of like I ended up in Oz. Before Disneyland, everything was black and white and eh. After Disneyland, walking in, life became, I clicked kaleidoscopes, a kaleidoscope. It was all the zillion, million colors, all fitting together and changing, and, and emotions. So my Disneyland experience was wonderful, beyond wonderful. I love it. And you even got to lead a tour at Disneyland too, right? Pardon? You also led a tour at Disneyland, didn't you? Yes, I got to be a tour guide. Are there any tour guides in here? <laughs> I can't. I hope. Anyway, oh, um, there we go in the back. I got to wear the plaid. Yes, I see you. I got to wear a plaid, um, and that was a bit. They, they gave me forty-eight hours to learn the spiel. <laughs> I was very anxious, as you can imagine. I took the tour. And I, I hope it was okay. If you're in here, I had you on a tour. I'm sorry if it wasn't the best. <laughs> but I did my, I tried. Uh, so that tour was wonderful. But I have to tell you, this experience, because I had not been to Disneyland, and, and I want to tell you, when I interviewed Val and Holly, had me at hello. Sorry, I had to use that. It, it was, I just knew that I had to have Disney. So I'm out there. I go into the tour guide lounge. There's a number of, yeah, the photo, there's a number of tour guides in there, and they're, they're talking, and they're enlightening me, helping me out, and I just noticed how much they loved Walt, how much they projected his dream, how much they wanted to make our guests informed and en enjoy their tour and happy. So, they even, they, they, before we went on tour, we checked our hair, our makeup, our hats, uh, our shoes, but they, they polished their shoes every time before they went out. And I, I just thought that was such a wonderful detail. So um, the thing is, I did learn, because I was fortunate to be on some of the attractions, that every cast member had that big heart for all things Disney, for they, everyone wanted to do their best, make Walt proud. And there was literally, this was in 70, there, there was a, a pulse of Walt. It's like you walked around and it, Disneyland whispered to you, Walt did this, Walt did this. So it, it was amazing. Oh, I love it. Now, George, you know, not every Walt Disney World cast member had an opportunity to go to Disneyland first and feel that sense of Walt everywhere they went. Um, and I love this quote that kind of illustrates this, that you contributed to our book. You wrote, very few of us had ever visited a Disney theme park, let alone operate one, so we worked along the guidelines and training that we were given. And for everything else, we made it up as we went along. <laughs> I'd love if you could share a little bit more about that. Maybe an example, perhaps. The things I can share, the things I can't share. Yeah. <laughs> so, the 
opening management team for the most part, both in hotels and in the parks, had all spent the summer at Disneyland with the idea that they would then come and open Walt Disney World. So for the parks operations, actually there was much more knowledge and because Disneyland had been in, you know, open for many years, they had much experience. But when it came to the hotels, if you think about 1971, so the hotel was started in the late 60s, First of all, there were not hotels like this anywhere in the world, with few exceptions, the Hyatt in San Francisco, the Hyatt in Atlanta, but there just weren't big hotels, so you didn't really have anything to go on. And everything that the teams were able to find from sizing of restaurants was all based on those hotels, which were convention hotels, which did not have families. So as you, you all know the drill, after opening day, the minute this hotel filled up, there was not even close to enough capacity for anybody to eat. And so everybody had to quickly figure out, you know, how do we switch to buffets or how do we make the menu not quite so extensive so we can turn the tables faster. But the fun part was that you know, everybody was learning at the same time. So you just sort of figured it out and did it. If that worked, okay, we'll keep that until we need to change to something else. So that attitude, uh, because we didn't know any better, actually made us push harder to get to a solution. And, and we wouldn't know it. It seemed like just a, a well-oiled machine the entire time. Yeah. So, at least from my perspective. So, Heavy, I actually want to go back now just a little bit, because we've been talking so much about that drive, that so much of the cast, it seemed like, was all united in that mission to fulfill Walt's last dream. And there's some photos you shared with us of many of the top leaders of Walt's new productions at a special event. Tell us about these photos and these people and, and their commitment to seeing Walt's dream through. Well, let me start first with, I started at Disneyland in 1965, and Walt Disney was still walking the park. Oh. And Dick Nunes was in charge of operations, attractions, and, you know, one of the first things you learn is everyone is a VIP and we're a first name organization. So, you know, if Walt Disney were to come to my attraction, I would say, good morning, Walt. Um, so I was kind of prepared for, for that camaraderie. Um, when we spent the two weeks at the Ramada Inn, there were many executives there helping us learn about the project so there was this real sense of teamwork and we're really all in it together so we're helping each other mm -hmm. and, and and this went from card walker don tatum marty sklar john hench you know just incredible people with enormous responsibility mm -hmm. And so, you know, going, th working through that two weeks to prepare for the press conference was, was uh, a challenge, but you really felt you were part of a large team. And after the three days, we had a chance to just take a big sigh, and there was a kind of celebratory barbecue at Bay Hill. And so these are pictures of uh, uh, Bob Allen in the red sweater, Valerie Watson, that whom Debbie has mentioned in the in the red hair, and then some of the other uh, hostesses from the press conference. I'm there in the little white babushka, Ooh. and Admiral Joe Fowler is part piloting our flow boat. Oh, sorry, is that? <laughs> and he was in charge of all construction. And then here's another really sweet picture of Roy and uh, Sharon Bernstein and, and uh, Valerie. And here's Roy just relaxing. Um, he and Edna were there on the lawn with us, and the, I mean, he couldn't have been nicer and more appreciative of the effort that everyone was making to bring Walt's dream to life. Wow, so incredible. You had that moment, that moment to relax, take a breath, but then it was time to get the place built. And Debbie, you were there watching this castle rise up from the ground. The construction was, um, was, as I understand, a little bit hectic in those days. Um, but then eventually, grand opening, you were there for opening day, you were there for grand dedication day with the Disney family. What was that experience like for you? Oh, that was such a beautiful, beautiful time. Uh, and again, if I, look at, if I think about the whole weekend from Saturday, Sunday, and then to Monday, to dedication day, it was just a 
swirl of deliciousness, it, it, the whole thing. And you would have to have your jammies, and we'd have to have a sleepover with out in the hall to talk about all of this, that all the stories we could tell. It, it was uh, electricity in the air, the guests, they were ecstatic as we were. And, and, and again, you, the guest, and the cast members, you love all things Disney, we love all things Disney, we want you to have the best experience and fun because we do the same thing when we come with our families. So dedication day was my favorite day, my favorite day. I had the opportunity and the great honor, which was not lost on me, to meet Miss Lillian backstage uh, behind City Hall and get in one of the Main Street electric cars to take her uh, down Main Street. It was interesting because some of our guests we're like, oh, there's Miss Lillian Disney. Well, they didn't say Miss. Um, it's other thing. They, uh, so, and then some people didn't know who this amazing, beautiful woman was riding with me. She was Walt's love and partner. She named Mickey Mouse, for Pete's sake. You know, it was like, she was, she was a star. So uh, we got to the town square, and I know Peggy was there. We, uh, got out of the car and got her to her seat. Oh, and this one thing I really gotta share with you. And that is when she sat in the car, we're backstage, behind the house, she sat down and she went, like a huge sigh. And all I could imagine was what she was thinking, that, that, uh, that emotional sigh when, you know, thinking about Walt and here they are, dedication day. So uh, she got to her seat and actually uh, I, started to, I, I touched her hand over in the car and she smiled and we had a little chit chat. We, we got to her seat and I, she didn't, but I started to have tears in my eyes. It was so emotional for me. I, she was seated, I turned around, I was glad I didn't have far to go to my seat. So that was a special moment for me. Oh, Lovely lady. Well, George, on Grand Dedication Day, I heard you were here as a busboy at the Contemporary, um, but obviously you would rise the ranks into many executive leadership roles across the company. One very important question for you. Did you ever wear Dick Nunes' Bermuda shorts option? <laughs> yes. <laughs> One day. So the, uh, we all talked about it because, you know, when Dick told you that you should do it, it wasn't really an option. So we thought, what would be the safest day? So I was the GM at the Grand Floridian at the time. And so we chose the 4th of July holiday. We thought that would at least be potentially, that would theme. And uh, we did it. Uh, we were incorrect in the theming and incorrect in just about everything else. But to be honest, as you all know, it is hot here in Florida in the summer. and. It was a good idea, it's just, I'm not sure we uh, were quite ready for it. Dick was ahead of all of us, from a fashion sense. There we go. Now, one question actually involves this project right here, which I know is very dear to your heart, among many of the projects you've worked on. Tell us a little bit about why Millennium Village is so special to you. I think when you uh, think about Walt Disney World and you listen to the video of Walt talking about his vision and then you hear Dick and Marty talk about Epcot, the ability to bring people together from all over the world and have them live and work together so that hopefully they could in fact uh, in their adult lives help one another and make a better world. It, Epcot I think has always, you know, that's, that's been Epcot. But the Millennium Village was a special moment in time where we could add 50 more countries. And um, that group of 600, they came in uh, two waves of 300. Still today, um, they stay in touch. They've had a reunion every five years. And I've been to every one of them. I fought, I'm part of the WhatsApp group. And um, when you see what they have become as a group of young people to leaders in their countries, uh, elected officials, the, if you recall, and I know many of you do, there was an exhibit from Eritrea, which was the smallest, we had three cast members, and this one cast member, it was a coffee ceremony, and you sat on the floor, and it was an individual, amazing experience. This lady, it represents Eritrea in the United Nations now. 
So anyway, it, it's come full circle, and this one, I'm proud of everything, but this one has a special place. Oh, I love it. Making a mark on the Disney legacy makes a mark on the world of art. And George, we were just so delighted that you were recently honored with your own window on Main Street USA. Congratulations. And I can't imagine what it's like for each of you to look back across 50 magical years of this place. And we thank you so much for your time this morning. Everyone, please give a big round of applause again to George, Debbie, and Debbie. For our next segment, I just have to say that our book and this presentation... New passengers, we welcome you aboard our Highway in the Sky and hope you've enjoyed the Magic Kingdom. We're traveling to Disney's...